Amen. If you don't have plans this evening and you're looking for something fun to do, you can come and cheer on the church softball team at 5 p.m., weather permitting. We'll be at O&J Middle School. Last week, there was a barn burner. We lost 25 to 4. And uh, we're in the need of a miracle. But, but in all honesty, uh, I don't think, uh, there's a few, we won't go name and names, there's a few that join the team in spirit of competition, uh, I would be up there as well, but uh, we've been having a wonderful time, it's been awesome to see the group that God's put together for this, and uh, so it's always a good time, if you don't have anything to do, we invite you out. Do you believe in miracles? Yes! yes. That is one of the most famous calls in sports broadcasting history to ever cross the airwaves. Announcer Al Michaels yelled this as the U.S. hockey team pulled off one of the greatest upsets in sports history. Anybody remember that? That was eight years before I was born. <laughs> Come on, somebody. 1980. If you can remember, you, if, if you remember the time and the place, maybe, did they have TVs back then? Okay, I just went in. <laughs> Gus, you, get, you know, I can only build you up from here, right? <laughs> Anybody ever seen the movie The Miracle if you didn't get to experience in real life? It's based on the 1980 Olympic Miracle on Ice uh, USA hockey team that shocked the world. Two days uh, after beating the Russians, the U.S. defeated Finland and won the gold medal. But, uh, you know, if you, if you grew up, I actually grew up uh, not too far, about 30 minutes from one of the players, and they had a, a sign on the road that, you know, so-and-so uh, lived here, right? He's like in the Hall of Fame of Michigan now. But um, it was because the Soviet hockey team had won for the past 20 years the, the Olympic gold medal for hockey. They were a dominant team. They were a dominant in the world and in all us. And just before these Olympics, they had destroyed the all-star team, which was made of many of the national hockey players, the, the pros. And our American team was full of amateurs at the time, mostly college kids from, uh, to the, from the east to the west coast, all, all around, every age, a young group of kids, and they were seated 12th in the tournament. No one expected them to be able to pull off this victory or even place a medal around their neck except them. Herb Brooks was uh, is, is the, the coach and he made famous for, for uh, stewarding this, this team to a victory. He was charged with assembling and coaching this group of amateurs. Before the dream of gold could become reality, he had to unify a team of guys who came from different backgrounds, different colleges, and different parts of the country. He had to maximize the energy inside of these young guys, knowing that if they could just get together, man, they could do great things. Unity did not come easily, though. When they first sat down together, he asked them, who do you play for? And each of them, in their own way, would respond, I play for the college of, and I'm from. And they were all different answers coming from here and there, here and there. And uh, Brooks knew that this would have to change, so uh, after a half-hearted performance in an exhibition game, uh, he had them do iron sprints on skates. Now, if you have ever played in sports, they're called lots of different things. In basketball growing up, they're called gut busters or suicides, and, and this, uh, this, this um, documentary is called Iron Sprints, but this idea that you have to get on the baseline and go to, the, go to quarter qu uh, ice and then c come back and then half ice and then go back and then three quarter and then come back and then full, and they're doing this over and over and over again because they just played miserable. And he wanted to teach them something. He did this until they were beyond exhaustion. And during this brutal workout, he yelled, Who do you play for? All of them just stood in silence or kneeled in silence until one player responded. I play for the United States of America. It was a defining moment. And with it, he dismissed practice. The group of individuals became one. They no longer saw themselves as playing for a different school, but as playing for the USA. They became a team. Each player committed themselves to be unified for a greater cause. The energy and contribution that they had given individually became maximized. It was beautiful. 
It was an impact. It changed our, our culture, our sports culture. It put us on a worldwide stage even. It did impossible things in a social level because a group of college guys understood what it took to be unified. I believe in miracles, especially the miracle of unity. It's a miracle to have unity with anyone or anywhere or in a group of, of people because we live in a world that is so drastically divided. I mean, you, you click on the TV and you'll, you'll hear this side and you'll hear that side. It's so divided that uh, I, I don't know if it's possible to get a large group of people on our own to be unified. It takes, I believe, the Holy Spirit. It takes, uh, it takes an impossible God to make it happen. What is it that should unify us, though? Last week we talked about what we shouldn't do. We shouldn't carry offense. We shouldn't, we shouldn't uh, throw people against, you know, uh, uh, accusations and, and hold grudges and, and different things like that. But this week we want to talk about what, what should unify us. Peter would suggest that it is having the mind or the attitude of Christ. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 8 through 9 is where we are over these three weeks in this series. Teamwork makes the dream work. And let me just read that to you out of the New Living Translation. Finally, all of you should be of one mind. Sympathize with each other. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tender-hearted and keep humble attitude. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't hesitate with insult or don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and He will bless you for it. It's having the mind of Christ. What should unify us is having a common goal, a common directive, a common destination. It's having the attitude of a Savior. Not of any Savior, of the Savior. Being of one mind and having the unity amongst each other is the idea of being surrendered to the mind of Christ. His thoughts are our thoughts. Romans 12.2 says this, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Man, if, if, we, if we unify ourselves to the thoughts and the attitude of Christ, the mind of Christ, it opens up a doorway of heaven to know God's will, His good, pleasing, perfect will. Now, if you were in the adult Sunday school, uh, right at the end, you guys basically preached my sermon. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate that. <laughs> Paul and Russ, they were like, going. Oh, I was like, man, they're preaching all my material. <laughs> if you want to live differently from culture, uh, from, from the culture around us, Paul, the apostle, is suggesting that it starts with our thinking. Or Peter, Peter, is, uh, Peter is as well. It starts with our thinking. Be of one mind and then do all these things. It's a matter of coming to a place where we allow God to change our thinking. Uh, we, had a, 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 <laughs> we had a saying in, in Alabama, you got stinking thinking, right? Like that's a lot of times what, what, what causes disunity amongst us is our thinking. It's the way we view things. It's the way we hold things. It kind of addresses last week and carrying offense. But it starts with our mind. It's a matter of coming to a place where we allow God to change it. See, it takes surrender to experience transformation. It takes surrender to experience true transformation. Don't copy the customs and the behaviors of this world, but let God transform you. It's a choice. We have to make a decision to no longer think and do the things that we're used to thinking and doing. But we have to choose differently. We have to allow God to transform us into a new person by our thoughts and our actions. We are instructed to take every thought captive and be transformed by the renewing of my, our mind. And then we will know His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Unity first shows up in the way we think. Next week we'll talk about what unity looks like and how we act, and as Peter kind of went on to say that. But I, I want to get to this idea this morning that unity first shows up in the way we think. In order, in order for us to experience unity, we have to understand this, and there's a little fill in the blank in your bulletin if you're interested. It's this idea that unity starts in the mind before it flows from the heart. Unity starts in our mind it starts in our thoughts. It starts in our preconceived ideas. It starts in our attitude 
before it can flow from our heart, before it can influence our actions, before it has any effect on the community around us. If we want to be a unified people, we have to adopt the mindset of Christ. To be unified together, we must allow our thoughts to be his thoughts. So how do we have the mind of Christ? How do we have the attitude of a savior? How do we allow God to transform our thinking? First and foremost, I, you can't ignore the idea of it comes from the consumption of his word. It comes from the consumption of the living word of God. I'm not talking about actually eating this thing. Some of you are like looking at me like you're starving. Like, we'll get out of here in about five hours. It'll be fine. But it, it, our, our thinking begins to change. It, it, get, it is influenced uh, so easily by, by anything that comes before us. And, and, and even, even for, um, for the non-visuals in the room, anything that you just start processing. I don't know about you, but there are times where I just zone out. I had one of them in the, I was in, the, in our living room yesterday. We were in between activities. I just sat down and I was like staring off in the distance. And Kristen said, Chris, are you all right? I was just like, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Like, you know, like your just mind can go wild and go crazy but if we really want our, our thinking to be transformed, we have to take account for what we're allowing in. We have to take an account for what we're allowing to influence us. And if we want our thoughts to be his thoughts and, and, and to have the attitude or the, the position uh, that Jesus carried, we have to get into his word. We have to consume this thing. We have to get in on a daily basis and understand and, and, and study what it means to, to live as Jesus lived, to, to take upon ourselves humility and grace, forgiveness. It's transformational when we make a, a, a move of surrender. We say, okay, I'm going to make a choice to not allow uh, the content from TV to influence me today, but I'm going to put the word first. I and mean, I'm not going to allow the, the behaviors around me at my job place to influence my thinking. I'm going to put the word first. There's a, when, when we make that choice of, of surrender and say, okay, I'm not going to go after this or, or, or lean into this like I normally do. I'm going to make a conscious decision to not allow that to be the loudest voice. It's still going to be a voice. But for it to not be the loudest voice, I'm going to raise this to a new standard. I'm going to uh, elevate my, my, my decision-making based on the consumption of His Word. I'm going to ask for Him to speak louder through His Word than He has before. See, if we're not in His Word, our thinking remains of this world. The Word of God shows us the mind of Christ. It shows us the attitude of a Savior. It begins to transform the way we think and the way we, the way we approach things. In order to have the mind of Christ, we have to have the, the word of Christ. See, there are so many things that influence your thoughts and my thoughts. I, I don't remember the exact stat you threw out, like some 80,000 to 100,000 thoughts that go through our mind a day. Wow. Some of you have a lot more right now, I know, right? Like, and we have to make, it's like this, it's like a continual, uh, you know, like a, a Gatling gun, a repetitive fire. We, we have to make a choice. As soon as it comes, are we going to listen to that thought or are we going to submit it? Are we going to listen to that idea or are we going to surrender it? Are we going to choose to just kind of allow whatever we're around to influence us or are we going to try to stay and make a decision to stay steadied and founded upon the word of God? But in order to make that decision, we have to be in the Word of God. Our, 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 our generation right now, our, our, our culture, our church culture right now, is, is one, if not the most, biblically illiterate cultures and generations that we have seen yet. It's the goal of the Assemblies of God and our, and our, our new leadership in the last year or two to, to change that. And I have to wonder if we're struggling uh, in the church, the, the church people, the, the body of Christ, if we struggle with the things we struggle with because we're not in the word like he intended us to be in. We're not tied in to the way he thinks. 
We're not, we're not tied into the way that he looks at things. We, we kind of, oh, we know, we know Jesus and we know a couple scriptures. We've memorized a, a few things and, and, and we can think back when we need to and call them to memory. But it's really not taking, uh, it's not really uh, affecting the way we process on the day to day. It's really not causing us to, to change anything about how we think. We're still insecure. We're still fearful. We're still depressed. We're still suicidal. We're we're still uh, anxious about all things. And the word says, be anxious about no things. Because you know what has replaced this word? Oh man, right? These and phones. I don't have my phone up here. I'm a great example today. You're welcome. <laughs> that, like there, there's so many other things, right? There's so many activities. There's so many news articles. There's so many channels we can surf. There's so many websites we can visit. There are so many different things that we can allow to influence us, but we have to make a conscious choice if we want to have the mind of Christ, if we want to be unified in all that we do. We have to make a choice to get into the Word of God. It takes the discipline of allowing the Word of God to penetrate deep into our thought process. I've never met someone that knows the Word like really knows it that isn't different. Like you can meet someone that knows, and knows a little bit about the word, but there's still something that, there, there's still something that, that is hanging on that, that is them. But when you meet someone that knows the word, like, like man, they, they eat it for breakfast, they eat it for lunch, they eat it for dinner. It's all, it's, they, they consume it all the time. I'm not talking about weird people either. I'm just talking about someone who knows the word and loves it to such a degree that it's, it, it embodies everything they think about, every, uh, how they act, how they behave, how they react. Man, when you know it, there is a difference because it takes a discipline to allow it to penetrate deep into our thought processes. It can't happen just once, one Monday a week. Like opening our, our, our word, the word of God just once a week. Say, God, transform my thinking. It's not going to happen. It has, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a continual repetition. It's a continual process because you have to allow him to get, go to places. You have to allow the word to go to places that are deep within our thinking. The way in which we react to things, knee-jerk reactions, the way we think about ourselves and we think about others, the thoughts that fill our head when we're bored or tired, when we allow the word of God to sift through our thoughts, that's when transformation happens. We do this by meditating on it, by practicing it, by memorizing it. Scripture says, may I hide, my, my, may I hide your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. May, may, I, may I consume this thing, O oh God, so that my thoughts are not my own, but they're yours. Man, if we want to be a unified body of believers... If you want to be unified in your marriage, if you want to be unified in the relationships you have with your children, there's one thing and one thing only that brings that unity closer together and faster than anything else. It's the consumption of his word. It's the devotion to the discipline of getting into the word of the living God. The word of God is what gives us the ability to exchange our thoughts for his thoughts. We are given an invitation to look at the world in which we live that drastically different, but it's an invitation at best. It's nothing I can put on you. It's nothing I can copy and paste to your email inbox. It is an invitation saying if you're tired of your stinking thinking, if you're tired of viewing things the way you view things, if you're tired of, of reacting the way you react, if you're tired of being an emotional crazy mess, the invitation still stands to get into the Word. If you don't have a Bible, we have Bibles for you. If you don't have a Bible, you understand. I'll give you a Bible, you understand. I believe that there is nothing outside of the salvation of Jesus Christ more transformational than getting into the Word of God. And I'm here to tell you, I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect at it by any means. But I know that when I make it a discipline and when I devote myself to getting into this word and allowing it to go to the deep places of my thinking, man, my wife can attest to you, I'm a different person. I, when, when I spend time in the presence of the Lord, I, I change drastically. 
And it's because I believe that when we allow surrender to take place, transformation happens. Unity starts in the mind before it flows from the heart. You can talk about being unified. You can, you can act like you love everybody. But unless it's in the core of your thinking, unless it's in, it's, in the, it's in the body of what every thought passes through, there's going to be a limit to it. But when you allow your thinking to be transformed into the thinking of the Lord, the attitude of a Savior, man, that's when unity starts to flow. If we want to be unified in the mission and the vision that God has for us, we have to think like Him. And the way we learn to think like Jesus is by knowing His Word to see people the way he sees them, situations the way he views them, obstacles and challenges the way he does. The word illuminates thoughts and motives that need to change. I think that's why we're so resistant to it sometimes. One, it takes time. Two, it's, it, it, sometimes it's, 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 it feels non-relevant to our life. But the other thing is because sometimes it causes a little, yeah, really God? Do I, do I really have to look at that? part of my life? Do I really have to think about that, that area right now? Do I really have to get rid of that? Do, are you really, like, if you allow it to, it will begin to illuminate what needs to develop, what needs to change, what needs to be transformed. So what does the Word show us about the thought structure of a Savior? Let's look at a passage from Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 through 8 says this, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? It sounds a lot uh, very similar to 1 Peter 3, doesn't it? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other. Love one another. And working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of, our, uh, thinking of others as better than yourselves. Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think, himself, uh, uh, think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine, human, or his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Paul here says that we have to have one mind and purpose. The same attitude. Uh, uh, there has to be unity. And then he goes on to list what that attitude looks like. And then he says that you must have the same attitude or mind that Jesus had. So he's saying, hey, I want you to be unified. Believers, I want you to be unified. This is the call of Jesus. This is what it looks like. And just to let you know, this is the attitude that Jesus himself had. If you look at verse 5 in the King James translation, it reads this. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Different translations read that verse differently and, and, and some, some people say, well, it's just saying that Jesus was a model and others are saying, no, no he, this, is, this is Paul laying this out to be an example of how we should live and how we should treat each other. Some, are, some translations would read verse 5 and it, it, wouldn't, it would be suggesting that, hey, it's there for us, but not that it was necessarily Jesus. But in the King James, it's interesting that it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The word shows us a picture here of what it looks like to have the same attitude as Jesus had. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble. Thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look only at your own interests, but take interests of others. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. The word shows us that there is this opportunity we have to live in such a way that mimics the attitude of Jesus not only mimics it but adopts it as our own that we have an opportunity to be transformed by the renewing of our mind and to think differently of others to think differently in middle of circumstance to think differently when we come come up against obstacles simply put put yourself last 
The attitude of a savior, the mindset of Christ, is simply to put yourself last, to serve and love others. 1 Peter 4, 8 says, love deeply. To put others before you no matter the cost. Unity starts in the mind before it flows from the heart. You have to be thinking of not yourself, but of others if you're to have the mind of Christ. And you have to have that at the core of your thought process in order for it to actually flow from your heart. It's all connected. It's this idea that in order to know the thoughts of Christ, we have to allow the word to take over. In order to, to, to know what, how he acted, we have to see, we see it in scripture that this is his attitude that he carried and it was simply put to serve and love others. Our thoughts have a way of derailing our desires though, don't they? We can want to love others and we can want to serve others and we can want to live as Jesus lived and we can want to be humble and all those things, but our thoughts are still there. They're still nagging at us. They're, they're still trying to distract us and derail us. We can want all these things, but selfishness and greed still rear its head every once in a while. Colossians 3, chapter, uh, chap Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 2 says this, Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven, where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. I want to read it to you from uh, the message translation. It says this, So if you're serious about living this new resurrection life with Christ, act like it. Pursue the, things over, pursue, pursue the things over which Christ presides. Don't shuffle along, eyes to the ground, absorbed with the things right in front of you. Look up and be alert at what is going on around Christ. That's where the action is. See things from his perspective. See, we can, uh, we can desire to live differently. We can desire to be unified. We can desire to have our thoughts be transformed. But there has to be an intentionality on our half. There has to be, there has to be a move on our half, like uh, it's, it's like sitting uh, at the table playing chess. I don't often do it anymore with my father-in-law because he beats me in like three moves. Um, but uh, it's, like, it's like, like, I want to win, I want to beat him, but I don't even know where to begin. I don't, I don't even know where to start, but you know what? I'm only gonna get there if I make a move, right? We can, we can, we can have all the desire and all the want and all, and, all, and all built up, man, I, I want to be different. I want to think differently. I want to be free of insecurity. I want to be free of fear. I want to be free of, 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 of you know, just uh, feeling like awful all the time. But you have to take a step at some point. You have to, you have to enter into this arrangement that he's put before us. And so, and so Paul writes to the Col Colossians, set your mind on things above. The Greek word here, used here for set is, in this verse, means to seek after, to strive for, or to be intent on. It tells us that we must choose to live. It's not something that just occurs one time and we can forget about it. It's not just like flipping on a switch. It's a, it's a daily choice. It's an intentional action from our heart that if this is what we want and this is what we desire, to love one another, to be unified with one another, to think differently about each other, then we have to take a step daily. It's a way of living that allows us to be set free from the things of this world that hold us back or hold us down. To set your mind on things above is to one of two things. To look at life from God's perspective and to seek after what he desires. So often we look at life from our perspective. The short term, the immediate. Everything's a problem. Everything's chaos. Everything's the end of the world, right? The sky is falling, the sky is falling. To set our mind on things above, to make the intentional choice that I'm going to think differently, that I'm going to live differently, that I'm going to look at people differently is, is to choose to look at it from God's perspective. It's not all or nothing. It's not always uh, 
uh, um, an emergency. That God has a plan set out and he can see the end from the beginning. But it's also, to set our minds is also to seek after what he desires. So many times our, our thoughts get wrapped up in trivial things because uh, well, I, don't, I don't believe we were ever intended to think about the trivial things. He's, 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 he's directing us to think about the heavenly things. He's directing us to think about the promise that he's given to come back for his church. He's directing us to think about the, to, about, about, about the reward that awaits those who serve him and love him with everything they have. Now, don't get me wrong. We have to think, you have to think about your job Tuesday morning, right? You get in trouble if you don't think about that stuff. But, but, but there comes this point where we have to transition. Our, our thinking has to be transformed to where we start looking at things from God's perspective. It's full of grace. It's full of mercy. It's full of joy. Forgiveness. And where, and where we start not looking only at the, the monetary things or the momentary things or the things that please us here and now, but we start looking at them from a, a heaven. We, we start seeking the things of heaven instead of the things of this earth. If we're going to experience unity in our homes and with one another, we have to be intentional and setting our thoughts on the things of heaven. I'm gonna invite Kristen to come. Intentional on having the mind of Christ. Where are your thoughts at today? Where's your mind, at been, where's your mind been at lately? What, is, what has been consuming you? What has been taking over? There's worry, there's fear, there's anxiety, there's struggle, there's pain, there's the unforeseen emergencies. We have a choice today to allow the Holy Spirit to come in, to surrender who we are and what we have to Him. Say, God, would you take my thinking? Would you take my anxiety? Would you take my doubts? Would you take my stubbornness? God, would you transform it? Would I begin to see things from a heavenly perspective? Would I not be so irrational? Would I not be so quick to judge? God, would I begin to seek the things of heaven? Because it's when we begin to get to that place, church, that unify, uni unity truly thrives. Where we're not just trying to meet our needs. And I'm not just trying to meet your needs. But we're trying to seek together after the things of God. Where we're pursuing a fresh revelation of His Spirit or pursuing a fresh move of his presence. So how do we transform our thinking? How do we live with the mind of Christ? First, it takes a choice of surrender. It takes a choice of surrender. The, the way I am thinking and living, is it what Jesus wants or is it something different? You're here today, you've never surrendered a thought, you've never surrendered a, a decision, you never maybe even have surrendered your heart to Jesus. That's the baseline. He invites us into this relationship. He invites us in to be able to, to, to live and to think and, 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 and to act like he did so that we can, we can reach people. So that we can reach people with the hope and the grace of heaven. But it starts with surrender. So if you're here today and you need to give your life to Jesus, you need to give, your, give him a chance, start a relationship with him. I want to go back to the passage in Philippians. It 
It says, you must have the, attitude, the same attitude as Christ Jesus had. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. And when he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God. And he died a criminal's death on the cross. That death was for you and was for me. It was to pay for our sin. It was to pay for our thoughts. It was to pay for, for our error. It was to pay for the very thing that separates me from God and you from the Lord. So today, the first choice might have to be surrender. Maybe you need to surrender your life. Maybe you just need to surrender what you're allowing to influence you. Allow the, secondly, it might be just making that, that conscious decision, decision to say, all right, I'm going to put this word in front of me on a daily basis. I'm going to begin to consume the word of the Lord like I haven't before. I know, I know something has to change. I know I need freedom. I know, I know my thoughts have to change. I know, I know that, man, I, I, I've, been just, I've been just too, too down and out. I, this, is, this, is, this cannot be what God intended. I, I would suggest it's not. And, th and this word is full of promises. It's full of truth. It's full of hope. It just takes us opening it. It's not meant to sit on a shelf at home. It's not meant to, to, to gather dust. It's meant to be opened on a daily basis, to be read, to be studied, to be meditated upon. Maybe three, you just, just need to start being intentional. You just not, need to start intentionally setting your mind on the things above. And, and that, that takes practice. Okay, I'm not going to think that way. You're in the middle of a conversation and you, you're going to have to stop yourself from thinking a certain way or, or, or you're in the middle of, of reacting a, a certain way. No, I'm not going to do that today. I surrender it. I'm making an intentional choice to, to submit to the authority of Jesus and His Holy Spirit. If we want to be unified, it starts in our mind before it flows from the heart. I don't know where you're at today. I know the Lord is here. And I know He's speaking. I want to invite you to stand to your feet this morning. I'm going to invite our prayer team forward. I believe God wants to challenge us in our thinking this morning. I believe he wants to do something. He wants to transform us. He wants to, he wants to revive his spirit in us. He, maybe he just needs to remind you of how he created you today. If you bow your head and close your eyes with me this morning, just out of the respect and the reverence of what the Lord's going to do in this place. standing or you're sitting here this morning and God's calling you to a place of surrender today you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart into your life you've never given him every thought you've never surrendered what you have to him I want to give you that opportunity this morning to start a relationship with the savior of the world Nobody's looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed. If that's you, would you just slip up your hand and say, Pastor Chris, that's me. I believe God's asking me, he's inviting me today to start a relationship with him. Would you just slip up your hand so I can pray with you? I'm not going to embarrass you. Or... Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. You can put that hand down. Is there anybody else here today? Say, I know I need to surrender my life. I need to give him access. Praise God. 